So, uh, hello, hello everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, I will present uh, harnessing machine learning and high performance computing in additive optics for high contrast imaging in the Subaru telescope. Quite long uh, title. Uh, this is a joint work between uh, my team in uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center, me, Bartomeu Pou, uh, Sergi Albiac, who is in the in the public, Eduardo Quiñón is my supervisor, Mario Martín, who uh, is my supervisor from UP, uh, Universita Politécnica de Catalunya, Damien Gratador, who is my supervisor from Observatoire de Paris. And also I collaborated with the people from the Subaru Telescope, uh, among others, Vincent Deo, Kyohun An, Sebastian Bievar, Julian Rossi, and my supervisor there, Olivier Gullón. Uh, so, if uh, a bit of an introduction of the, my journey. Basically, uh, my work has been in the context of rising stars. Uh, this is an international project with many collaborators. The BSC Mobile Grant uh, partially supported my stay in Paris. So basically, uh, last year from January to December, I went to Paris to work with uh, people from Blesia in Observatoire de Paris. Uh, then uh, at the beginning of this year, I moved to Hawaii, uh, to Hilo, uh, to work with people from the Subaru Telescope. And also I moved one month to Canberra to work uh, with people from the Australian National University. So uh, quite an international journey. Uh, so let's start with the introduction. So first, uh, what I'm doing is uh, the, the goal of this project is high contrast imaging. So the main goal is to detect uh, exoplanets with direct imaging. The exoplanets uh, detection is quite difficult because the, there's a high contrast between the star and the planets. As you can see here, this is an image of uh, direct imaging uh, of uh, a star with some exoplanets. They put in the center uh, what they call a coronagraph, which basically blocks the center light of the star. And then we need to detect exoplanets there. And the, the, the exoplanets are very faint. They only reflect the light of the star. So it's a very, very small amount of light and we need to make some kind of uh, analysis of, of that images to detect the exoplanets and for that it's very important wave from correction and stream adaptive optics that I will get into later. So second I get into why I'm doing this so yeah the main goal of this is very ambitious basically we want to find life in other planets uh, so if we are able to direct image um, exoplanets, we will be able to do one, the so-called spectroscopy, which basically allows us to identify different elements of the planets uh, because uh, the elements absorb certain uh, wavelengths. So for example, here on the right, we have uh, Venus, which has a certain spectral lines of absorption. And the Earth, which has a certain spectral lines of absorption, we can know that there's uh, water in it, and then Mars. So if we are able to direct image exoplanets and then we do spectroscopy, we will be able to find what they call biosignatures, basically signs of life. Uh, so it's it's uh, very interesting. Uh, so next, next I, I'm here with ground-based telescopes. So there are two types of telescopes, those ground-based telescopes, the ones that are in at Earth inside, and then the space-based telescopes like the James Webb Telescope. The main difference between the two is that it's very, very, it's much, much cheaper to build those ground-based telescopes compared to the James uh, to, to the space-based telescopes, and uh, also if there's some kind of problem, it's much easier to fix, of course. So there's a lot of uh, positive arguments to build such uh, telescopes. R right now, there are a lot. Of te such telescopes around the world, mostly state of the art is eight meters of the di diameter, 10 meters of diameter. But currently they are building uh, the so-called extremely large telescopes, which will be between 25 and 40 meters of diameter. Uh, and this will be very important for detecting the previous exoplanets uh, we mentioned before. So the, the three that are being, built uh, right now are the 30 meter telescope in Hawaii, 
uh, the extremely large telescope in Chile and the giant Mag Magellan telescope in Chile. The extremely large telescope is being built by the Re European Union, so it's uh, important. So the problem that those ground-based telescopes have in uh, contrary to the space-based telescopes is that we have the atmosphere, uh, which creates uh, a lot of problems, basically. As you can see, uh, we can think of the light as a wave. So when the star emits the, the light, we have a spherical uh, wavefront. Then over long distances, we can think that it's so long that we see just a planet wave from, but then, but then this enters the atmosphere and there is the atmosphere is a non-homogeneous uh, medium. So basically there's a lot of different uh, temperatures, uh, a lot of different uh, properties uh, among different points of the, the atmosphere. So basically, if you remember from high school physics, we have a refraction, which uh, light when enters to different medium changes velocity and uh, direction. And when the planet wavefront enters the atmosphere, basically we end up with a distorted wavefront, uh, which we need to correct somehow. So on the right, uh, you can see um, what we would see without the atmosphere and what we see without just by uh, direct imaging without any correction. Uh, this, this is without correction, and then we'll explain how we correct. This is, will be with correction. This is the uh, Neptune planet. So how do we correct for this problem of the atmosphere? It's basically wave from correction. Uh, so we use adaptive optics. So adaptive optics, the most simple system is a single conjugate adaptive optics, which has uh, three components, which are the wavefront sensor, which indicates how um, how much distortion there is in, in the wavefront. Then we, we have the def uh, deformable mirror. You can see here on the bottom how the deformable mirror corrects for the distortion. Basically, it enters a distorted wavefront and then it outputs a planar wavefront. So this is how we correct. And then we have the real-time controller, which will be the software system that sends the how to move to the DM, basically. Uh, and then this is very important that to say that this operates in real time and at high speeds. So we have between one and two kilohertz. So this needs to be uh, hard real time. Uh, basic, on, on the right, you can see the full diagram of the system. Basically, the light enters, the deformable mirror, and we have the camera in the end. The, the light is split here, a bit goes to the camera and a bit goes to the wavefront sensor, and then the real-time uh, control system just send the commands to the deformable mirror. Okay, so uh, next one. So here I will explain uh, the wavefront sensor I'm using. Basically, I'm using the pyramid wavefront sensor. This uh, wavefront sensor is uh, was developed in the the end of the la end of the 90s decade. And this is a very sensitive uh, wavefront sensor. There were some other wavefront sensors which were less sensitive, but more had more linear characteristics. So basically, this what does is characterizes it characterizes the distortions on the wavefront. It's very sensitive. However, compared to other wavefront sensors, it, it has a more nonlinear relationship between the output of the sensor and the phase we are trying to correct. However, uh, despite having a uh, nonlinear relationship between the sensor and the phase, they usually build uh, just a linear relationship between the output of the sensor and the commands you should um, send to the DM to correct for this phase. Here I have a diagram of the wavefront sensor. I, I won't get into detail, but basically it's called pyramid wavefront sensor because we have a pyramid in the center and this produces four phases. So basically, the light uh, the light focuses on the tip of the pyramid. And because the pyramid has four sides, we have four faces. And this allows to estimate the gradient of the, the incoming wavefront. And then on the right, we have a top-down image of the pyramid wavefront sensor that I got it from Skexel, the, the Subaru telescope, sorry. So next. Uh, once they have this uh, linear reconstruction with this simple matrix vector multiplication, uh, 
we need to think how to put that into the system because it's not as easy as just getting that um, reconstruction and put it into the EM to correct for the wavefront because we have many sources of error that can um, that can diminish the performance of that reconstruction. For example, we have noise, we have temporal error. When we reconstruct the the phase, there is a delay when we put a, a command into the DM with the real-time controller, there's the time that it takes to compute that command and the time it would take to move the DM. So there's some kind of delay and there's a temporal error, which, so we need to take into account that there's non-linear effects on the pyramid wavefront sensor. It's uh, one of one of the sensors that have the most non-linear effects. There's ali aliasing. Uh, so basically what they usually do is this integrator log, um, basically it takes the reconstruction at time T and we integrate over time with the previous commands. So the C uh, big is the, the command that we will send to the DM and the C small is the current reconstruction and the current time step. And we just sum the reconstructions over time. Um, so important for high contrast imaging, the main source of error is the temporal error. So we should, if we want to diminish that source of error, we should do uh, the, the how we set the commands into the DM more intelligently. So to do that, they come up with many, many algorithms of predictive control. Basically, we need to take into account that when we put a command at, the, at a certain time step, the atmosphere will have a bulb when the command is, when the DM is really moves um, into, into the position we want. So we need to build some intelligent algorithm to make that uh, work better, basically. Okay, uh, finally, just uh, an introduction to modal basis. Basically, uh, this is a concept where they use predefined shapes of the of the formable mirror that have certain properties. For example, they are orthogonal between them or mostly orthogonal. Uh, one example to do that is just take the distance on actuate of actuators and do the a principal component analysis on that. And you, you get these really nice shapes. So basically you can describe a face as a sum of those predefined shapes. Um, and you have lower spatial frequencies on, on the, you have lower modes, so mo low, lower spatial frequencies modes where you have very shapes with a very low spatial frequencies and uh, shapes with very high spatial frequencies. So sometimes in the pyramid wavefront sensor, we have this problem that you get confusion between modes. Uh, the, the problem especially are in the high order modes. So sometimes we need to filter them. Basically we cut them of the of the reconstruction because otherwise nothing works. Just a, an introduction to modal basis. Okay. So now let's go back. Let's go to the to the Subaru telescope. In the Subaru telescope, I was in uh, this team, the Subaru Coron Coronographic Extreme Adaptive Optics team. So some, some description of the Subaru telescope. So basically the Subaru telescope is you see the image on the left. Um, it's, uh, it's located in Big Island, Hawaii, United States. It has 8.2 meters diameter and it's at uh, 4,000 meters. And the team, the Subaru Coronographic Extreme Adaptive Optics, the goal is, as I said, uh, high contrast imaging. And they have uh, their system here. So first is that on the left, we have the telescope, but on the right, we have the adaptive optic system, which is Skexeo, which is very, very small compared to the telescope. So the deformable mirror actually is very, very small. So imagine that it's a huge telescope. Um, so yeah. So more on Skexeo. Basically, Skexeo is a bit different no, than the image I showed you before, because in Skexeo, they have two loops. They have first uh, first loop with a very small amount of actuators. So it's called AO188 because it has only 188 actuators. And then the Skexeo loop, it's the second stage loop, which has many more actuators. It has 2,500 uh, actuators. So the, the first loop corrects the low spatial frequencies and the second loop corrects mostly 
also low, but also a lot of high spatial frequencies. So here in the Skexeo loop, I have the deformable mirror, again, the beam splitter, where it, where it splits the light between the, the science camera and the sensor. Here I have the pyramid wavefront sensor, and then I have the real-time controller, which is called Skexeo 6. On the right, just an image of the, of the server box of the, the rack, where we have the different GPUs. In the, this is in the telescope, I took it myself. And important to know that we have uh, in this system, we have five GPUs and two CPUs with 64 cores each. This will be important for later. So the motivation for my work is basically, as I said, a high contrast imaging requires exquisite phase reconstruction and we need prediction in real time. And I also want to experiment in a realistic environment. So basically what I did is, uh, I developed a plugin to handle the real-time uh, streams and to connect to telescope software. I used uh, the TensorRT, which you know, basically is a library of NVIDIA for optimized neural network inference. And I connected this with Milk and Cacao, which are the packages that they use for the telescope software to, to connect to the different data streams. And we also tested these new machine uh, methods on the Skexio bench. So still we haven't tested on Sky, we just tested on the bench with the uh, Doom, Doom closed. So the different alg algorithms. So first here I, I show you uh, the proposed pipeline to correct both for... So our idea was to correct first for the nonlinear reconstruction of the pyramid wavefront sensor. That, as I explained, the pyramid wavefront sensor has a high um, nonlinear component. So instead of using a simple matrix vector multiplication, we wanted to use some neuro neural network. And then second, we have we want some predictive control part which corrects for the temporal error. So we have the, these two components, and we will have some post processing, and the predictive control will be trained on real time. So first, uh, the nonlinear reconstruction, we want to characterize this uh, nonlinear behavior of the pyramid wavefront sensor with a neural network. Uh, we use supervised learning, basically. How we do it is we train on the, with the DOM closed, we don't have uh, on-sky data. We move the deformable mirror to simulate some kind of uh, turbulence, because in the end, the deformable mirror is also a phase and we can simulate some uh, perturbated phase. And we want, we move this mirror randomly in order to predict any possible input that was coming from the on sky. We want to generalize to any distribution. We used uh, uh, this neural network called UNET, which is uh, very famous for um, computer vision tasks. Basically we take the process pyramid wavefront sensor image and we predict a phase and this will work as the reconstruction. Then we have the predictive control, which will we did this with reinforcement learning. Basically, we want to try to correct the temporal error with the reinforcement learning, the basics of reinforcement learning with the trial and error. Um, in this case, we have a policy, which is a function that takes the state and predicts an action that maximizes cumulative reward. And we have to define state action and reward in adaptive of this case. Basically, the state will be the current reconstruction in the current time state and a history of reconstructions and commands. You have to think that um, this history is necessary for the predictive control because we need to predict what will happen in the future based on information on the past. And then the reward basically is to minimize the reconstruction value because if we have a reconstruction that is zero, means that the wavefront is planar. And finally, the action will be uh, some kind of integration over time as in the integrator case. Uh, this is also important that will be online training. So we need to train in real time. It, it doesn't have to be hard real time, but it needs to go fast enough in order to, to adapt to changing atmospheric conditions. So I'm basically the diagram here will be, we have the deformable mirror, we have the pyramid wavefront sensor and the aerial controller, and this will go to the, to the camera. Um, so, so for the training, I'm so I'm using an algorithm called soft actor critic, which has two two components, which are the critic, which is only used in training, which 
takes the state and the action and predicts how good, so given a state, how good will be an action. And then I have the policy or the actor, which takes the state and just predicts an action that maximizes uh, this action. If it would go inside the critic, it would maximize, it would be the action that maximizes the output of the critic, basically. Uh, on the inference, we have only the actor. The inference, uh, important to know that initially we'll have this exploration phase we, where the soft actor critic just uh, put some noise on the actions in order to explore the optimal actions. In the end, we will find some kind of uh, optimal action. Uh, basically, it takes the value of reconstruction, takes the state, we build the state from there, and uh, we produce the action. Also, we, we have some post processing part. Uh, as I said before, we have this modal basis where we need to filter high order modes. Uh, so we do that here. And then we integrate over time and then we clip in order not to break the bench in case that the, as is machine learning, you never know. So we need to clip the values in order uh, to be safe for because we are treating with a real system. Uh, and finally, we want to do this combination of the unit and reinforcement learning in order to basically, if there's a lot of turbulence or uh, we are in, yeah, basically, when there is a lot of turbulence, the pyramid wave front sensor might end up in the zones of nonlinear uh, reconstruction. So if we combine those, we will avoid the problem where the matrix vector multiplication won't be able to, to, to function properly. So here, basically, we will the reconstruction, which is the sysmol from the nonlinear, for, from the unit. Um, so putting in it all together, this will be the full pipeline. We have a, a pre-processing pipeline where we take the image of the pyramid wave front sensor. We have to do some pre-processing here. Of, for example, in case that we use the unit, we have to do the normalization, but also we have to uh, do many small things related to real system. For example, we need to subtract. We, we do normalization of the flux, Basically, we divide everything by the, um, the sum of all the values of the pixels. So it can work for different types, uh, brightness of stars, basically. And then this goes either into the MBM or the unit. And we do the predictive control with the reinforcement learning. We have the post-processing part. And then we also have the training at the same time. Uh, here, the... We have some results in a, on a simulated environment. Uh, basically, these are all results. Uh, initially, we we simulated these algorithms on a simulator called Compass, um, and we got some results. Basically, here you need to know that stress ratio. We have stress ratio that is a measure of quality of the imaging system. This can be between zero and one. And we have R0, uh, which is the measure of the strength of the turbulence. Here, I have two simulations. Basically, you have R0 low and R0 high. So as R0 high, the turbulence is uh, less, uh, yes, less strong. And R0 low, the turbulence is worse. We have y-axis straight ratio. We have x-axis the frame number. Uh, and then we have three three different kind of controllers. We have just the integrator, which uh, in the with the lower turbulence case it does very very bad, and in the higher turbulence case it does similar to the other three. Then we have an integration with the nonlinear reconstruction that would be the mix of linear and the unit, uh, which I said before, and more or less is stable in all the cases. And then we have the predictive control on top of it, which would take the nonlinear reconstruction. And it it surpasses it surpasses all of them. These are results of of a paper that we did uh, some time ago, which is PI in two thousand twenty two. And uh, then we have finally we have the projection, which would be the maximum performance what one could achieve in this case. Um, so now we need to go from the simulation to Skexel. 
So basically some things that we need to take into account. Basically, we, we don't have uh, access all the time. So before I could train my models all the time and find a, and find a solution at some point, but that's not possible anymore. Also the, the hardware, it's important before I could use a lot of GPUs, but here they only have five GPUs, the, the ones I mentioned before. Um, okay, there is also the, the problem of a lively experiments. So this was an issue I had all the time is that I train for a new end model, but they change the bench itself every few days because they're constantly experimenting. So I needed to retrain my models every few days. So important to take into account. Then we also need safety measures uh, for not breaking the, the instrument. We also need to take into account real time in the simulation. I don't need to do anything in real time. I just can wait uh, as much as I need. Uh, for the training, as I said, it's not in the critical path, but we need to train it as fast as possible to catch up on turbulence. And finally, they use a specific model basis, which I, I've never used before. I won't get into detail, but just to mention that the model basis is not the same I usually used in the simulated environments. This one is specifically made because they have a second stage system. And in, usually I work with just a one stage systems. So let's deploy the neural networks into Skexeo. Uh, so in, in Skexeo, they use uh, this library called MILK, which stands for Modular Image Processing Library Toolkit. Uh, it's basically high performance image processing with shared memories. They, this has three components, which is the function parameter structure which is basically reading and writing for uh, parameters for processes. Then process information, it gives you the information of the different processes. And then you have streams of data, which will be, for example, for the pyramid wavefront sensor, you have one stream of data. Or for the commands, you have another stream of data. Then th this, is a, this library is quite interesting because it has a lot of modularity. So I was able to build without uh, having to touch the other parts my my TensorRT framework. So here I have uh, the, the diagram of the different three parts. So basically we have shared memories that are modified by any processes in the, in the software, which are the streams. And then we have the shared memories that are linked to a single process, which has the process info and the function parameter structure. Um, here I have, uh, so cacao, actually, this is compute and stands for compute and control for adaptive optics. So milking could be applied to anything in general, but cacao is the application of uh, milk to adaptive optics and the software of the super telescope. <coughs> so here, basically, uh, I'm showing an example that they have uh, for uh, cacao, basically. Uh, also, a thing I have mentioned before is that this works with semaphores. I have a camera which grabs the frames and then based on the semaphore values, we can process it. And then this goes to the deformable mirror and so on. Everything working with semaphores. And then on the right, I, I show different uh, panels that they have for control. So basically he, here we have what they call the function parameter structure control which has uh, the process name on the right and the, and if the process is running or not in green here. Uh, they also have stream control and process info. So basically you can see the different streams. You have uh, the stream data type, the stream name and the update frequency. So you can know how fast is your stream updating. And then the process info is just saying if the status if it's active or it has crashed and the process name. Um, so what I've done here is I integrated uh, MILK with TensorRT. I, I can explain it in two parts, which are offline training models like the unit and online training models like the reinforcement learning. So the code structure here, basically, uh, it's just I, I did everything in C++. And then I milk is written in C, so I had to make a C wrapper and wrote everything in C++ to connect to TensorRT. 
And then for offline training models like the unit, it's very easy. It's just uh, we have an input stream, we have normalization, and then with this TensorRT model, which I just trained in Python and I just put it into this code. And then uh, we have the denormalization and then the output stream. So quite simple. Uh, however, the online training models are a bit more complex because, well, we have the Python. So we have the, the training process, which currently is in Python, and we have the, the, the inference process, which currently is in C and C++. So here, one, uh, one problem that we have here is that we need to copy the weights from process two to process one every a certain amount of updates and copying the weights takes some time. So what we have done here is we just have a second thread that wakes up when we have to copy the weights. And once, uh, once it's copied, we just swap the two models and then it goes to sleep again. And basically this way we avoid the time of copying the, the weights. So some results from the, the bench. So first here, <coughs> uh, I have the, the some results in for the reinforcement learning in the Skexeo bench. So some things, the, the loop is running at two kilohertz. We are controlling 500 modes. Uh, with a bright star, the atmosphere turbulence we are simulating it with the with the deformable mirror movement. That means that we are not observing the sky. We are actually simulating some kind of turbulence profile. We, this is just testing for later uh, test on sky. <coughs> uh, well, we have certain parameters like wind speed or the amplitude of the atmosphere. Also, uh, here it's important to know that as we are in second stage, the, the simulated turbulence will reduce some the amplitude on the lower order modes because we simulate as if we would have the first stage working at the same time. Um, and so on the bottom, we see the, the image of the pyramid wavefront sensor. And then we see the the correction, so we have the deformable mirror correction, and then we have the input turbulence as we are putting into the end to simulate this uh, turbulence. And then we have the residual. The residual is just the difference between what we are putting into the DM and the current turbulence. So you see that it's it's reduced by a one order of magnitude. <coughs> and here again, we have strain ratio and frame number. Uh, we have just the reinforcement learning uh, and the integrator, uh, which is the linear reconstruction um, uh, control law. And then we can see that after 20,000 frames, more or less, we, uh, we get uh, to surpass the integrator performance. The strain ratios here are quite high because here, as we are putting the turbulence in the deformable mirror, we don't have extra added turbulence that would be higher frequencies that the deformable mirror can make basically. So that's why it's almost one. But probably when we observe on a sky, this would be 10 points uh, lower. And also important to know that the eval equals true is the point where we stop exploring and we just select the optimal actions without any other noise. Um, so some results of the unit. So how we did the, the, the unit training was to basically we move randomly the, the deformable mirror. We gather a data set of wavefront sensor image and face, and we train the unit with uh, some loss. And again, well, yeah, the model only worked for a few days, so we had to retrain everything every few days. Uh, here I have some results of the unit. So basically, uh, we can um, predict, we can move the deformable mirror to certain shape and see how the unit does and see how the linear reconstruction does. So here on the top, we have the, the reconstruction of the phase of the unit and on the bottom of the linear reconstruction. And then we have the current turbulence that we put into the DM and we have the residual, which is the difference between the two. This one is quite similar in, in value in the residual, so it's very similar, but 
on the right, I show another image which shows the the residual Rumin square compared to the input turbulence Rumin square. So basically, we want this to be zero. And we have two curves. We have the unit, and we have the linear reconstruction. The as we see on the lower uh, lower tur input turbulence, the unit makes it uh, the linear reconstruction and unit is more or less the same uh, value of reconstruction. But once we go to stronger turbulence values, the unit does much better. Um, some other results. Uh, basically here, uh, I'm showing some results of how much time it takes for in average. So if can we run at either one or two kilohertz? So I run uh, different processes at uh, some loop frequency. So in this case, I, I run it at one kilohertz. I'm uh, using two GPUs, a uh, 6000 uh, RTX 3080 and one CPU core per process. And I'm using this uh, unit. And here I have the average time of the critical path is uh, this value. So we, we could run at more than one kilohertz if, if we wanted. So it seems uh, quite good for the unit. Then we have the same for the reinforcement learning, but with a uh, MBM. So no unit, just linear reconstruction. Um, here it's the full pipeline, but just with the matrix vector multiplication. And then here it's uh, this virus. So it's 0 0.5 milliseconds. So we can run at more than two kilohertz. So this is perfect, more than enough. Uh, and finally, we have the combination of everything. Uh, this one is a bit more tricky. So here we are using four GPUs. We need uh, one GPU for the inference of the reinforcement learning, one GPU for the unit, one GPU for the training, and the, uh, one GPU for the MBM if I'm using the combination of unit and MBM. And this could run at around one kilohertz. We are working uh, right now into, into looking if we can improve these times. Uh, uh, yeah, well, here is uh, some example of what we run. So. So this is the milk interface. So basically here I show two things. I show the, the stream control where we can see the how fast is this shared memory called the MDISP01 updating. Uh, this is basically the command I sent to the deformable mirror. And then here I uh, we have the different processes. I will activate this unit reconstruction five, which is the unit basically integrated. And then we have the, the pyramid wavefront sensor on the left. Uh, this one is after processing. So it's not the real image. It's just a processed image. And then here they have a panel where we show different channels of the deformable mirror. So the output on the deformable mirror will be the sum of the different channels. So we have the turbulence is one channel. And then we have a second channel that will be um, that will be the output of the unit and uh, yes basically this is just to show that everything it works uh, more or less on, on real time so here we activate the unit and we see the output of the unit and we see here the sum of the unit and turbulence uh, here uh, here we see the, the frequency I achieved if I, if I don't cap it achieves more than one kilohertz um so some issues here that i'm working currently basically i have some jitter yes uh oh sorry so basically here uh this is the just uh, iteration time by by the time it takes for every iteration for the unit so most of the time it's it, it's around the average time i showed you before However, I have some spikes that I'm currently looking into. So this is very important to solve uh, if we go on a sky, because otherwise I, it will, will not work. Um, I have similar results for the reinforcement learning, and of, especially for the combination of reinforcement learning and unit. So it's a thing that it's a work in progress. Also, second thing that is work in progress is the the 
the time it takes to learn. Basically, as I showed you before from scratch, it takes around 20,000 20, uh, frames to learn. So if the time for update uh, is uh, 0 0.08 uh, milliseconds, we take uh, 26 minutes. Uh, so while this is true, still reinforcement learning won't be learning from scratch all the time. So we need to, maybe it learns fast enough. But I'm, I'm working currently in trying to make the training time faster. And uh, so finally, so well, yes, the, the goal here is to open the dome. So we want to on Skype uh, add people of this culture within neural networks. So here an, an image of the Subaru telescope opening the dome and observation of that on, on Skype. Uh, basically, I have implemented different models on Skexeo. I have validated them on the simulation. I have done the real-time implementation. Uh, and have validated them on the bench. However, I need to do a few things before going on Sky, which first I need to reduce this jitter. Uh, I, again, I need to improve the training time and I need to test all of it in real time, all the components in real time on the bench. Uh, and uh, that's it. Um, and the conclusion, well, uh, Skexeo is a unique environment. Uh, to test these new ideas in this state of the art telescope. Uh, to be fair, it's it's very different from other telescopes because I think this is the only telescope when you really can test crazy idea, crazy ideas on a sky. It's really hard for other telescopes to do this kind of test. So I'm very grateful for this opportunity. Uh, I demonstrated this uh, the potential of these new machine learning methods uh, on Skexeo. And I highlighted different extra difficulties. Also, I plan to release this uh, library of connected to Milk soon. I already did a conference uh, uh, the previous week, pre uh, two weeks ago, and I, I told my colleagues in the narrative of this community that I will do that. But at first, I would like to solve this jitter. And then, yes, I, I hope I can test all of this on Sky. I will have opportunities to test, uh, I think, August, October, September. From August to, to November, I, I will have one or two opportunities every month. So hopefully I can test it uh, those months. And hopefully this will be a new way of computing all of this in, in antibiotics. Um, thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Yeah. The questions. Uh, um, what is the How many times can you do the model? How big is yeah. it? So you said that it takes time to copy all the answers. So, so the reinforcement learning model has, uh, so it's convolutional neural networks. Uh, and it has two hidden layers of uh, three by three filters and uh, six, so 64 filters each hidden layer and the kernel size is three by three. So the, the number of parameters there, I'm not uh, sure on the top of my mind, but it's not so big, this one. Yeah. But instead, the unit is much bigger uh, because it has many, many layers for the nonlinear reconstruction. And the problem is like for the thing, so you uh, predict the uh, future based on the um, how, how many images do you have in the thing and in the pool? So it's uh, the pool is constantly updating. So I, I cap it that I keep the last 50,000 images. Uh, I this is something that maybe I could optimize, maybe I could instead discard everything every 10,000. But in the end, after, in the end here, after 10, 20,000, it learns. So I need to, yeah, in the end, if 50,000 will keep everything here. So it's a, maybe a number to optimize actually. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the quality of images, the size of them is? So, uh, so in this case, it's uh, 50 by 50 uh -huh. input and output. Instead, for the the unit, uh, for the unit, I have 
120 by 120 is the input the, because the unit takes a pyramid wave front sensor image and the output is 50 by 50 which would be phase because because the deformable mirror has 50 by 50 actuators um yeah and one more question mm -hmm. yes uh, you choose this map because it's because of the uh, type of images, like because it's high mm, high contrast images. Oh, okay, so for reinforcement learning, it's um, so I choose the this is convolutional neural networks because imagine that you have a deformable mirror, uh, so the solution in the top left part of the corner can be also used in the bottom right part. Uh, of the deformable mirror so we so convolutional neural networks make it learn very fast because of that that one solution in one part of the image it can be used in the other part of the image and also the three by three uh, kernel size is used because the the the, the um, so the command in a single actuator only depends on the command uh, the next neighbors because, because the, the, the deformable mirror surface, let's say when you create a face with the deformable mirror, the face uh, in, a, in the neighborhood of a single actuator is affected mostly by, by that actuator, but also by the direct neighbors. That's why I use three by three and not five by five. And uh, for the unit, um, I also tried to use a simple network, which for the unit is it's a bit harder because we translate from, so from the reinforcement learning, we transfer, transfer from reconstruction to commands. So it's 50 by 50 to 50 by 50, but for the unit it's 120 to 50 by 50. So there's not this kind of relationship because the pyramid wave from, pyramid wave from sensor image, it's harder to have some kind of intuition. So I just tried the unit and it worked. But with the smaller networks, it didn't work so well. I don't know. OK, so. OK. So the problem basically is that is that the Skexo is very experimental. So they are putting new instruments all the time. They're trying a lot of stuff. So if I have certain light distribution from day one, maybe day two, they go up and they put a new thing there. And then everything is totally different. So yeah, it's really hard. I need, I need to retrain it. Uh, and uh, the cost for retraining, I... I actually haven't tried to start from a previous model and then train from there, but I'm not sure if that makes sense because it can really change a lot. The, the result, and it takes, for the unit, it takes a few hours and, and yeah, for the unit it takes like five hours, uh, five hours or six, because I need to recollect the data and then train. And the GPUs are limited, more people are using them. So it's a, a bit of a mess. For the reinforcement learning, it's a bit easier if the bench is free, but also many people are using the bench. So I, I can train it around 40 minutes because I also need to set up all my system. So maybe I would say one hour in total, I need to set up everything as I want and then train. Yeah. So in the I think that if we go to these extremely large telescopes, they will have everything uh, like very established so nobody can touch anything. And probably the model will work for many months, I would say. That's what I expect, but I'm not sure, to be honest. Okay, is there another question from the audience? Okay, so we have a question from the online mm -hmm. audience, so perhaps you can read it. Uh, why jitter is so important and how do you investigating what is causing it? So uh, let me put the image of the jitter. So basically, well, jitter is very important because 
I will lose frames. So if I lose frames here, um, as we are in a closed loop system, maybe we are integrating commands of the past and this can cause that the loop crashes and it diverges and it breaks. And this, even just for the integrator or, or using the unit as a integrator with a nonlinear reconstruction. But for the reinforcement learning is worse because as we are training online, maybe it thinks that something has happened, but we lose a frame and it hasn't happened. And then the training does not work uh, as expected. And this probably will, will make it crash even more. I haven't quantified this, but I'm sure especially for the reinforcement learning, this is an issue. And uh, what is causing it? Okay, this is a good question. Uh, so I have some hypotheses. You just how do you investigate? Okay, how do I investigate? So um, what I'm trying to do now is doing some kind of uh, trace with... Uh, uh, profiling with uh, NVIDIA Insight. Uh, so I'm trying to get the profile and to see uh, the, how much every function is, is taking. And uh, it, the cause of this, I'm not sure, but maybe I, I'm suspecting it's something related to the memory or the CPU, not the GPU. Uh, so I'm not exactly sure. They have, I'm, I'm taking a look at the, so they have some kind of CPUs that they allow for the, they have 120 cores, as I said before, two CPUs. So what I do when I do this real-time test, I just lock some of the CPUs only for my processes. However, I'm not sure if I'm doing that correctly because even sometimes I get different results. Uh, so I'm not sure what's happening. I think it's something related either to memory or CPU. So I'm, I'm taking a look there with the, the profiling. I don't know if that answers your question. Okay. Um, so if there are no, yes. Okay. Yes. So if there are no further questions, I think we can close. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.